Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our exercise on summing up and discussion and in this lecture we will sum up and discuss modules 4, 5 and 6. Now in module 4 we began with crime and punishment that is concept of crime, theories of punishment and legal remedies in civil cases. In crime we saw that the word crime has not been defined in any statute in any law primarily because it is difficult to define. A large number of people have worked on defining crimes. They have looked at crimes from different angles, from different viewpoints. So all of their definitions highlight a certain aspect of the crime. But none of these definitions that they have come up with are very precise and fully satisfactory. So we took a working definition of crime, which is crime is what a particular society at a given time says is a crime. So it reflects the values of the society. That is if you consider two societies, the uh, one thing that is a crime in one society may not be a crime in the second society. Similarly, as societies change with time, as the values change with time, a thing that was criminal before may no, no longer be a criminal offense and at the same time some things that were not a crime before may be defined to be crimes. Then we saw that crime consists of two parts, actus reus that is the forbidden deed and mens rea which is the guilty mind. So basically there has to be a physical act that is forbidden by law and that is the actus reus but just doing that act is not sufficient to call it a crime, there also has to be a guilty mind or a criminal mind that is mens rea. Now crimes proceed in four stages, intention, preparation, attempt and commission. And we saw that intention is a condition of mind. This is the first stage of a crime at which stage a person now makes a plan that okay, I am going to do such and such crime, I am going to steal from this person, I am going to kill this person. All of these things are intentions. Intention consists of foresight and desire that is a person wants to kill somebody and the person has made a plan, he has made a foresight about killing that person. Mere intention to commit an offence is not punishable primarily because intention resides in the mind of the individual and so we cannot prove or disprove if this person had an intention or not. It is something that is covert, it is hidden. And only when it comes out through certain actions, when it becomes overt, then only we can get to know that this person had this intention. So just having an intention is not punishable. Then we saw that intention is not the same as motive. Motive comes from the word mover, which is to move. So this is the force that makes a person make an intention. It is the ulterior that is underlying or hidden objective which prompts a person to form an intention. So if a person says that you have behaved very badly with me and so I am going to kill you. So you have behaved very badly with me. I have been offended. This thing is the motive that is pushing this person to make an intention. So motive is not the same as intention. And it is the hidden objective that has prompted a person, that has forced the person to form the intention. Now absence of intention may be a defense. So if somebody says I did not have an intention, it is a defense. But absence of motive is not a defense. And motive, however pure and laudable, will not exonerate the criminal. Then we looked at preparation. Preparation is devising or arranging measures for the commission of a crime. 
so in the stage of preparation once the person has made the intention he is now devising measures he is arranging for things for the commission of crime so that is preparation now mere preparation to commit an offence is not punishable with certain exceptions and these are the three exceptions in the indian penal code section 122 preparation to wage war against the government of india section 126 preparation to commit depredation that is attack or plunder on the territory of any power at peace with government of india and 399 which is preparation to commit dacoity so only in these three cases is preparation itself an offence so a person will get a punishment if he or she has done preparation for these things even though he or she has not attempted these things has not committed the crimes but mere preparation of a dacoity now dacoity is robbing by five or more people so if you have made the preparation it itself becomes an offence waging war with government of india and preparing to wage war with the government of india so here preparation itself is an offence if you have say collected weapons if you have uh, collected ammunitions to prepare war with the government of india then it itself becomes an offence and the third thing is if you are preparing to commit a plunder or an attack on any government that is fr has friendly relations with the government of india because in that case if you did commit these offences then it would be a very grave offence and so the preparation itself has been made punishable then we looked at attempt which is direct movement towards the commission of a crime after the preparation has been completed so if somebody has an intention to kill the other person say through poisoning so this person has now done his preparation that is he has purchased the poison now the next step would be attempt that is this person has added the poison to a food and given it to the target so that becomes an attempt even if the uh, the target does not eat that food and so gets saved so the commission has not happened but the attempt has already happened and attempts are dealt in ipc in three different ways the first is principal offence and attempt are dealt with and made punishable by the same section such as section 121 so in this case waging war against the government of india and attempt to wage war both are defined in the same section they have the same punishment another way is that the principal offence and attempt are dealt with in different sections with different punishments for example section 302 is murder section 307 is attempt to murder so both have different sections and different penalties and the third way is attempt to commit an offence that is not expressly provided for so all those offences in which case the attempt is not expressly provided for in the ipc are covered by this section 511 as you remember this is the last section of ipc so this is the general section for attempt so for instance section 379 is theft and there is no section that deals with attempt to theft and so section 511 will deal with attempt to theft then there are also certain other conditions like this uh, uh, offence should be punishable with an imprisonment not merely with fines so other things are given in section 511 then we looked at the commission of an offence commission is the act of committing the crime or offence so if somebody is trying to murder the other person if the other person is killed by this act then we'll say that the commission has happened and commission is always punishable so commission of any offence is punishable then we looked at theories of punishment and here we looked at why do we need to give punishment to prevent the occurrence of a crime to punish the criminals to compensate the victims to rehabilitate the criminals to deter the offenders from committing any offences in the future and to maintain law and order in the society so these are multiple reasons why we have punishment and there are five theories of punishment based on the society's attitude towards the lawbreaker so we have 
the retributive theory retribution means taking revenge we have the deterrence theory which tries to dissuade people we have preventive theory we have reformative theory and we have the multiple approach theory retributive theory says that the objective of punishment is to get revenge the punishment should match the severity of the crime and the objective is to satisfy the emotion of the of the retributive indignation that is the anger which is stirred up by the injustice so if a person is wronged if the rights of a person are violated then this person suffers an indignation he gets an anger inside of him and this anger can only be satisfied when this person gets an opportunity to take a revenge so this is what this theory says we need to punish people so that the person who has been wronged his or her anger is, anger is subsided now in this case punishment is an end in itself it is not a means of achieving social security so why do you punish because you have to punish to get revenge it's an end in itself deterrence theory tries to deter or discourage people dissuade people from committing crimes so it says that punishment say, serves as a check on others who are evil minded even death penalty is okay if it is an adequate deterrence so basically the deterrence theory says that if a person commits an offense you should give him a very large punishment an exemplary punishment so that other people are deterred other people think that okay if i also commit the a similar crime i will also get a huge amount of punishment so other people because of the fear of punishment they get deterred and so that is the objective of punishment another theory is preventive theory which says the objective of punishment is to prevent crime not to avenge it so it tries to control the recurrence of crime by incapacitating the offenders in the case of deterrent theory the aim was to deter other people but in the preventive theory you are trying to incapacitate the offender make it, make the offender such that he is physically unable to do the crime how do you do that you imprison the offender the criminal so if the person is locked in a jail he will not have access to the society so he won't be able to do a crime you give him death penalty so if the person is dead he won't be able to commit the crime give the person an exile so you put the person out of the society very far away from the society so that the person is unable to do the crime so this is what the preventive theory says next we have the reformative theory which says that the object of punishment is to reform the criminal so you are not trying to give him an exemplary punishment you are saying that even this criminal is a human being and even if this person has made a mistake done an offense then it does not mean that this is the end of the world so you should try to reform this person you should try to correct this person convert him back into a good human being and so just do not label this person as a criminal and treat him as a criminal you should try to reform him back make him an asset to the society as gandhi ji said hate the sin not the sinner and this is a more contemporary trend so we started with those earlier theories but this is a more recent trend in penology and attitude towards criminals it talks about proportionality of punishment don't give a very large punishment because if you do that the offender may turn into a more hardened criminal go with an individualization of punishment look at each and every case and see what is a good punishment for that particular case go with a humane treatment treat the person as a human being go with rehabilitation correction and readjustment to the society allow this person to mix with the society allow this person to atone his wrongs and become a good citizen again so it replaces tortuous methods of punishment with monetary fines and damages today we also have a trend of decriminalization of offenses so for example some offenses that earlier had punishments including jail terms now the governments are winding them back the governments are saying that these are not such great crimes that you should be jailed just a fine would do so 
a large number of offenses are now getting decriminalized and this also says the same thing replace tortuous methods of punishment with monetary fines and damages in a large number of cases they are enough it says no to death penalty only in the rarest of rare cases should you go for death penalty but it says if you kill the criminal then there is no option to reform the criminal so don't go with it and the fifth one is the multiple approach theory which says that every theory has its own merits and demerits so one size fits all approach is not going to work every criminal is different from the other criminal every circumstance is different and so in place of just sticking with one theory the courts should use multiple approaches depending on the case depending on the criminal depending on the circumstances in some cases they can go with an exemplary punishment if that serves the purpose of the society in some cases they can go with reformation in some cases they can go with the other theories so this is what the multiple approach theory says a combination of theories must be employed by the courts of law not a single theory now the supreme court of india in this case of mh hoskot versus the state of maharashtra said that there is a difference between a correctional approach to prison treatment and nominal punishment verging on decriminalization of serious social offenses so basically the honorable supreme court is saying that yes we are for a more humane treatment of offenders but this does not mean that the courts are going to decriminalize the offenses it is only the power of the legislature and so the courts should not venture into that because if you decriminalize especially things that are serious social offen offenses so in that case you are actually doing injustice to the person who has already already been wronged because you if you let go of the offender without a uh, an adequate punishment then it would have a very negative impact on not just the person who was wronged but also the future victims of the same offender and so while coddling is uh, so uh, the honorable supreme court says that coddling is not correctional that is just taking the side of the criminal will not correct him any more than torture is deterrent so just like a very high amount of punishment amounting to torture it is not a deterrent but at the same time not giving any punishment is also not correctional and it is a functional failure and judicial pathology to hold out a benignly self defeating non sentence to deviants who endanger the morals and morale the health and wealth of the society so basically these five theories of punishment are there and in our country we have uh, we have moved towards reformative and multiple approaches theory but with certain uh, specifications so you cannot hold out a very lenient sentence then we looked at the legal remedies in civil cases that are dealt with by the code of civil procedure the cpc now the cpc lays down the procedure to be followed in civil suits in india it has two parts body of the code or general principles of jurisdiction that are comprised of sections and then we have the first schedule which has orders and rules sections prevail over the rules in cases of inconsistency section 9 of the cpc gives the courts a very wide jurisdiction so courts to try all civil suits unless barred so courts can try all kinds of civil suits and jurisdiction is the competency of a court to take cognizance and decide a matter so courts have the competency to try all civil suits that is of a civil nature things involving determination of civil rights such as title suits money suits matrimonial suits right to office and so on unless the court is barred by some statute jurisdiction of courts is of three types we have territorial jurisdiction that is the geographical extent to which powers can be exercised we have pecuniary jurisdiction that is the amount or value of the case that can be presented before a court and we have subject matter jurisdiction that is if there are certain subjects for which the courts have been vested with powers then section 15 says 
courts in which suit to be instituted every suit shall be instituted in the court of the lowest grade competent to try it so if there are multiple courts then you will suit the uh, you will institute the suit in the court of the lowest grade that has the competency the honorable supreme court of india in hakam singh versus mrs gamon said that it is not open to parties by agreement to confer by their agreement jurisdiction on a court which it does not possess under the code so you cannot just make an agreement or a contract and say that in case of any dispute the matter will go to such and such court if that court does not already have the competency so agreements or contracts cannot confer jurisdiction violating the code then we have the place of suing in the case of immovable property the suit can be instituted where the property is situated and if it is situated in jurisdiction of multiple courts in any of those courts that is for the immovable property but in case of suits for wrongs done to person or movable property in that case the suit may be instituted either uh, in the place uh, where the wrong was done so if the wrong was done within the local limits of the jurisdiction of one court and the defendant resides or carries on business in some other location then the uh, plaintiff has the option of instituting the case in the first place that is where the wrong was committed or in the second place where the defendant resides or carries on business or personally works for gain so this is the option that is available then section 20 says other suits to be instituted where defendants reside or cause of action arises so this is also very similar then we looked at these this example that a resides at shimla b resides at calcutta c at delhi and all three of these together in banaras they made some agreement that is a joint promissory note payable on demand and deliver it to a and if they if uh, this promise uh, this uh, joint promissory note is not uh, paid for so in that case a may sue b and c either at banaras where this cause of action arose or at calcutta where b resides or at delhi where c resides but in if uh, a chooses to uh, sue them at calcutta or at delhi so in these cases if the non resident defendant objects the suit cannot proceed without the leave of the court so you will have to take permission of the court we looked at the definitions suit is an original civil proceeding between two or more rivals parties are the rival set of contesting persons in a suit so parties can be plaintiff the person who approaches the court or the defendant which is the rival party against the plaintiff there can be more than one or one plaintiff or defendant in a single suit then we looked at necessary parties a party is necessary if no effective or meaningful decision can be arrived at in his absence so in the absence of the necessary party you cannot have a meaningful and effective decision if the necessary party has not been joined we call it non joinder if an unnecessary party is joined then we call it a mis joinder so there there is this difference non joinder is a necessary party not having been joined in this case the suit is liable to be rejected but if you add an unnecessary party it is called a mis joinder and the suit does not suffer because of this then we looked at pleading which is plaint or a written statement then we looked at plaint which is the detailed application submitted by the plaintiff in the court seeking relief against the defendant and the written statement is the defendant's detailed reply so basically the plaintiff will file a plaint in the court and then the court will issue summons to the defendant in response of the summons the defendant will put up a written statement now this written statement will again be given to the plaintiff on the basis of the written statement the plaintiff can put up a replication which is further pleadings as a response to the written statement and then this replication can then uh, will then be given to the defendant and the defendant will reply to the, the replication for further pleadings the reply of the defendant will be known as the rejoinder the pleadings are not evidence 
and then we looked at the processes. So, if a plaint has been filed in a court, the court can return or reject the plaint. Return happens as per order 7 rule 10 for presentation in proper court. So, basically we saw that every suit has to be instituted in the court of the lowest grade that is competent to try it. Now, if the suit has been filed in another court that is not the court of lowest jurisdiction with the competency. So, in that case the court will return the plaint back to the plaintiff for presentation in the proper court. Now, if the return is made after the defendant has appeared then the defendant will also be given an intimation before returning. Rejection is done under order 7 rule 11 in cases where the plaint does not disclose a cause of action, the relief claimed is undervalued and when the court says that you have to change the value, the, the plaintiff does not do that. When the relief claimed is properly valued, but the plaint is returned upon paper insufficiently stamped. So, if the plaintiff has not put in sufficient stamps, then the court will ask the plaintiff to put the sufficient stamps. If the plaintiff does not do that, the plaint will be rejected. Where the suit appears from the statement in the plaint to be barred by any law, where the suit is, uh, where, where the plaint is not filed in duplicate and where the plaintiff fails to comply with the provisions of rule 9, which means that if a necessary party has not been included in this particular suit, then also the plaint will be rejected. It does not preclude presentation of a fresh plaint. Written statement is to be filed within 30 to 90 days of service as per rule 1 of order 8. Written statement should have documents relied upon in defense, specific plea of new facts, specific denials. Now, if you do not deny uh, a statement in the plaint, then it is assumed that you are admitting to it. Failure to deny specifically causes the presumption of admission subject to the court's discretion. So, the court may say that because you have not denied, so you are accepting it and so will rule in the favor of the plaintiff and there should not be any evasive denials. Now, next we look at the issue of summons. So, when a suit is duly instituted and admitted, then summons are issued to the defendant to appear and answer the claim. So, when the plaint has been filed, the court has accepted the plaint, then the court will issue summons to the defendant. Summons consi consists of the name of the court, the purpose for which the presence of defendant is required, when it is uh, this date of uh, date and time of appearance, signature of judge or the appointed officer and the seal of the court. And the summons will be accompanied by a copy of the plaint, so that the defendant can, uh, can study the plaint and understand what this case is all about and is able to make his own case. So, summons must order the defendant to produce all documents or copies which he or she intends to rely upon. Now, if the, de the defendant appears on the date of presentation of plaint and admits the claim of the plaintiff, then no summons needs to be sent. Once the summons has been issued, it will be served to the defendant. This can be done through direct personal service on the defendant if the defendant is living within the jurisdiction of the court or to an authorized agent such as the lawyer of the defendant or to the adult family member of the defendant, but not to the servant or it can be fixed when uh, these people are not found, then the service officer, the, uh, the serving officer will fix a copy of the summons on the front door or some conspicuous part of the house where uh, the defendant ordinarily res resides, carries on business or personally works for gain and then he will return the original summons with an endorsement stating that the summons has been fixed, why it was fixed because people were not found, name and address of the person if any who identified the house and witnessed the delivery and then this endorsement will be examined by uh, the court. The, the court will examine the serving officer and will declare whether the summons have been duly served or else if it is not duly served then the court will order other service. 
the summons can also be sent by post which is registered post acknowledgement due or by speed post or by a courier service that is approved by the high court or by fax and email if the high court has approved or it can be served directly to the plaintiff on application from the plaintiff. So, in this case the plaintiff would say that I am going to give it to the defendant or there can be a substituted service. So, if the if the person is evading, so in that case a copy of the uh, summons will be fixed on a conspicuous place in the courthouse or in the conspicuous part of a house where the defendant was last residing or was carrying on business or public or personally working for gain or it can be published in the newspaper or there can be beating of drums. Now, what happens if the parties once uh, the, uh, the hearing has started if the parties do not appear in the first hearing. So, if neither party appears then the court may dismiss or the court may give another date. If the plaintiff appears but the defendant does not appear. So, plaintiff is the person who has instituted the case. So, he, he is saying that I have been wronged and he comes to the court but the defendant does not come or his lawyer does not come. So, in that case the court can proceed ex parte. So, the court can directly look at his statement because defendant has been given a reasonable opportunity to present his case but is not presenting his case. If the defendant appears but the plaintiff does not appear. So, in this case the court has to dismiss the this particular suit there is no option with the court. If many plaintiffs and one or more defendant or many defendants and one or more plaintiff appear then the court may permit the suit to proceed as if everybody has appeared. Then we have framing of issues. Now issues are things that arise when material propositions of fact or law are affirmed by one party. So, either the plaintiff or the defendant says that such and such thing happened or such and such law is applicable, but the other party denies it. So, then things are known as issues. Now, the issues are framed in the first hearing and then in the later hearings evidence is taken of the parties and their witnesses to decide how these issues have to be resolved. Now, at any stage the, uh, the plaintiff has an option to withdraw his case, absolute withdrawal can be done without the permission of the court. The court has no power to refuse permission, but the suit will be dismissed with costs and you are precluded from bringing a fresh suit if you do an absolute withdrawal. In the case of a qualified withdrawal, you need to take the permission of the court. This is done when a suit is likely to fail because of some formal defect on where or when there are sufficient grounds for allowing the plaintiff to file suit for the same subject matter or part of the claim. So, these are two different kinds of withdrawals. Then we have the concept of compromise and the compromise can be done at any part at any time. So, the parties to the suit can compromise, settle the dispute, apply for a decree in terms of the compromise and it is a duty of the court to pass the decree in accordance with the compromise if it is lawful. It must be in writing and signed by the parties or their counsels or lawyers. Then we have the concept of abatement. In certain cases, the suit becomes redundant because a person ceases to exist as a party. So, for example, if a person dies, then there, there will be an abatement. But this abatement will not happen if the right to sue survives. So, if there is a person who is the heir of this party and can and has the right to sue, then there will not be an abatement. Similarly, there would not be an abatement if the death is after the hearing. Then we looked at interlocutory orders that are orders that are given between two uh, sayings of the court. So, it is a reasoned order on a party's petition during the pendency of a suit to provide interim relief or temporary injunction. Then we looked at injunctions which are judicial remedies that prohibit persons from doing a specified act or commanding them to undo some injury or wrong. And they are, they are of two kinds, mandatory which is comparatively uncommon and prohibitory injunction 
which restrains a party to do something which is more common. So, we have temporary and permanent. Temporary injunctions are governed by the CPC and permanent injunctions are governed by the SPA, the Specific Relief Act. Then after the hearings, there is the judgment, the statement given by the judge on the grounds of a decree or order. So, that is the judgment, the statement given by the judge on why the decree or the order was given. Decree consists of the formal expression of adjudication that is how are the rights getting settled. So, that will be there in the decree. It conclusively determines the rights of the parties regarding all or any of the matters in controversy in the suit. Once the decree has been given, the person may apply for its execution. Execution is the enforcement of the decree or order by the process of the court to enable the decree holder to realize the fruits of the judgment, decree or order. Then we also have the options of appeal where a person can make an application to a higher court for reconsideration or there can be a reference where the court itself refers a question of law to the high court or there can be a revision where the high court calls the record of any subordinate court and passes an appropriate order or there can be review which is re-examination or second examination by the same court. So, these things can also happen. The court's decision may be challenged in a higher court, the court may itself send the matter to the high court, the high court may take this matter from the subordinate court or the court can may re-examine or do a second examination of the matter itself. Then in the fifth module, we looked at the IPC, there were three lectures here, introduction, general exceptions and punishments. In introduction, we saw that it is Indian penal code, so it is applicable to India, it gives punishments and it is a code or a systematic collection of law or statutes. We looked at the preamble, why was the IPC made? To provide a general penal code for India. So, this is the objective of making the IPC. Section 1 talks about the extent and operation of the code. So, it is called uh, the uh, title and extent of operation of the code. So, this act shall be called the Indian Penal Code and shall extend to the whole of India. Earlier, it also said except the state of Jammu and Kashmir, but these words were removed by section 95.1 of the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019. What is India in the context of IPC? India is defined by Article 1.3 of the Constitution of India. What is penal? Penal means relating to punishment. And what is code? A code is a systematic collection of laws or statutes done through a process of codification. So, codification is the process by which you do a collection of the laws or statutes and you arrange them in a systematic manner. The historical background is that the IPC was drafted on the recommendations of the first law commission of India chaired by Macaulay. Now, this commission was made in 1834 under the Charter Act of 1833. The Charter of Act of 1833 or the Government of India Act 1833, it was enacted by the Parliament of the UK to extend the Royal Charter granted to the East India Company for an additional 20 years and to restructure the governance of British India. So, a draft code was made, submitted, then it was revised, then it was presented to the legislative council, then it was passed, placed in the statute book on 6th of October and in, it came into operation on 1st of January 1862. It is a codifying statute, so it is a law enacted by a legislator that is codifying the penal laws of the country. It contains the general laws of crime. It is not a specific law, it is a general law. It is substantive law, so it uh, defines offenses and prescribes punishment, but it is not a procedural law. It does not tell the procedure. The procedure is governed by the CRPC. It is exhaustive or complete code in respect of matters covered by it, lays down the general principles of criminal liability, general exceptions to criminal liability, defines offenses, prescribes punishment. For their commission, attempt and preparation. There is no punishment for intention. 
The code co consists of 26 chapters, 3 chapters were added later on, chapter is divided into sections, sections is given a numerical figure, section 511 is the last section of the IPC, we have looked at section 511 before. It does not, uh, the IPC does not have 511 sections because several sections have been added, some several sections have been deleted. So, the IPC is divided into two parts. The first is the general principles which comprises of introduction, general explanations, punishments, general exceptions, abatement, criminal conspiracy and attempts. So, these are the general principles. And the second thing is specific offenses, offenses against the state, offenses relating to army, navy and air force, offenses against public tranquility and so on. Now section 2 of IPC talks about intra-territorial jurisdiction. So intra is within, within territory jurisdiction or punishment of offenses committed within India. Now if an offense under IPC is committed by any person whether Indian or foreigner within the territory of India, then that person can be prosecuted and punished under the IPC by the court in India having its jurisdiction. So, it is immaterial whether the person is Indian or a foreigner. Then we have extraterritorial jurisdiction, punishment of offenses committed beyond but which may be tried within India. Then we have extension of courts to extraterritorial offenses for anything that is done by any citizen of India in any place without and beyond India. So, even if there is an Indian who is outside India and has committed an offence under the IPC, then he may be tried in India under the IPC. Or any person, whether Indian or foreigner, on any ship or aircraft registered in India, wherever this aircraft is or this ship is. And any person in any place without and beyond India committing an offence targeting a computer resource located in India. So, in all of these cases, the code is extended outside. Then we have uh, the procedure is governed by section 188 of CRPC. So, if the offence is committed outside India, then there is this clause of previous sanction of the central government. Now, this is to ensure that a person is not punished for the same crime twice, one under the IPC and second under the foreign laws. So, basically any crime can only have a single punishment. Then the next lecture looked at the general exceptions under the IPC. General exceptions are defenses that can be pleaded by a person who is accused of an offence to avoid the criminal responsibility. In this case, the burden of proof is on the accused. The general exceptions are divided into excusable acts that can be excused and justifiable acts that can be justified. Excusable acts includes things like mistake of fact, incapacity, very low age, insanity, intoxication. In the case of intoxication, it should be, be proven that the person was intoxicated either without his knowledge or against his will. If the person has taken the, the drugs himself or herself, then this exception will not apply. And then you have the cases of accidents. Justifiable acts include things like judicial acts, acts of necessity, things done with consent, communication made in good faith, things done under compulsion, trifles that is very small acts that a reasonable person would not object to and things done in private defense. In the case of private defense, the justifiable act extends to killing the other person in certain circumstances. Then we looked at punishments under the IPC. And these are the punishments under the IPC. You have the death penalty, imprisonment for life, imprisonment which may be rigorous that is with hard labor or simple imprisonment, forfeiture of property. Now forfeiture, uh, the absolute forfeiture is not there but specific forfeiture is permitted and there is the penalty of fine. Now the Punishment is at the discretion of the court and the extent of punishment is determined by a number of things. Nature of the offence, circumstances, age and character of the offender, whether it is the first offence or it is a habitual offender, injury that is caused to in the individuals or society, effect of punishment, correction and 
reform of the offender. In certain offenses, the only punishment is fine. Forfeiture of specific property is allowed, such as section 169, a public servant unlawfully buying or bidding for property. So in that case, the forfeiture is permitted. Imprisonment can be simple or rigorous. Life imprisonment means imprisonment for the whole of the convict's national life. But if you want to uh, look at some portion of a life imprisonment, then the uh, life imprisonment is taken to be 20 years. Then we have death penalty awarded in the rarest of rare cases and these are the sections that permit a death penalty. Then we looked at module 6, some special topics. Here we looked at interpretation of statutes, that is if there is any confusion, how do you read a statute? How do you figure out what the lawmakers actually intended? We looked at the laws of torts or tortuous liabilities and prevention of cruelty to animals act. In the interpretation of statutes, we saw that a statute is a written law passed by a legislator. Now, there are three uh, general rules of statutory interpretation. The literal rule which says that the statute must be given its plain and obvious meaning in the context of the act. We have the golden rule and the mischief rule. Now, in the literal rule, we looked at some general principles. Ejusdem generis means that if a specific list of words is followed by a general word, the general word will follow the same meaning. So, if you are saying that uh, things like cars, jeeps, trucks and other vehicles. So, in this case because this general word other vehicles is following a list of specific vehicles that fly only on road. So, we will take and other vehicles to be to mean those vehicles that fly on the road. So, because a specific list of words is being followed by a general word, so the general word will also follow the same meaning as is derived from the specific list of words. Expressio unius is exclusive of alterius. Expression of one is exclusion of others. Mention of one thing excludes all others. If there is a list of words, then it, the act applies to those words only. Nocitor resources, a word is known by the company it keeps. There are several benefits, it is quick, it is simple. There is uh, a very good separation of powers, the judge does not make the law, there is no scope for prejudice and it encourages precision in drafting. Now with time certain aspects have been modified such as in the case of tax statutes, if there are two constructions possible, the one in the favour of the citizen is to be followed. But then there are several drawbacks, at times it may lead to bad or unwise decisions, absurd decisions, it highlights the parliamentary mistakes and so it impacts the esteem of the parliamentarians. Mistakes even minor or typographic cannot be rectified, there is no scope for wisdom of the judge, it may result in absurd rulings and it gives parliament the right to make absurd laws. We looked at a case law, Whitley versus Chapel. It said that if a person impersonates any person entitled to vote at the election, then that person would be imprisoned. So, it is illegal to impersonate a person entitled to vote at the election. Now, in this case, one person impersonated the other person who was entitled to vote, but just one day before the election, the person who was actually entitled to vote, he died. And so, the court said that this person who is the offender has impersonated a person who is not entitled to vote because he is already dead and so this person should be freed. There will not be any punishment. Now in this case, the offender had done everything wrong what he could have done under the law, but just because the other person died, so he got this benefit. So this is an absolute ruling. Then we have the golden rule which says that the grammatical and ordinary sense of words is to be adhered to till there is some absurdity or repugnance or inconsistency. If that happens, then the, or, then the grammatical and ordinary sense of words may be modified to remove the inconsistency or the absurdity. A good example is this case of R. V. Allen. So, it said that whosoever being married shall marry another person during the life of the former husband or wife shall be 
given such and such punishments. So you are not, not allowed to marry twice. The person said, I did not marry twice because the second marriage is not recognized by law. So in this case, this absurdity was overruled because the court said that the, the second marriage is going through the ceremonies of marriage because otherwise this law will not make any sense. So by changing the meaning of the words, the uh, this person Allen was convicted. Another example is Adler v. George. So it said that no person in the vicinity of a prohibited place shall do such and such things. Now Adler was not in the vicinity, but he was inside a prohibited place. So the court expanded the term vicinity to include being inside the place and then convicted the person. There are several advantages. The drafting errors, minor errors can be corrected immediately. It provides for a more coherent meaning. But the disadvantage is that the judges have the power to change the meaning of words. So in that case, they are changing the law, which is basically a violation of the separation of powers because making the law should be the power of the legislature, not the judiciary. And in this case, the judges are changing the meaning of words to change the law. It does not help with, uh, when there is no absurdity and no test exists to determine if there is an absurdity. So something that one person says is absurd can be very much acceptable to another person. Then we have the mischief rule which gives even more discretion. It came up in Hayden's case and the court ruled that for, for this rule to apply, the court should look at what was the common law before the making of the act, what was the defect or the mischief in the common law that this act wanted to overcome, what is the remedy that the parliament has provided to overcome this loophole and the true reason of the remedy. And looking at these, we can uh, change things. And then the office of all the judges is always to make such construction as shall suppress the mischief. So it says that because the parliament wanted to suppress the mischief or overcome this loophole, so the, the judges should also make such construction that is interpret the statutes in a way that they are also able to suppress the same mischief. So basically the office of the judges is always to make such construction as shall suppress the mischief and advance the remedy. That is because the parliament also wanted to suppress this mischief, so the judges should also interpret rules that suppress this mischief. So this is the mischief rule. Example is uh, this case law of Corkery versus Carpenter. So it said that every person who is drunk while in charge on a highway or a public place. So if you are doing a drunk driving, then such and such things will be there. But when you are in charge of, uh, uh, in charge on any highway or other public place of any carriage, horse, cattle or steam engine. Now in this case, it did not say bicycle. But in this case, the court said that what is the mischief that this act is trying to, to prevent? The mischief that the act aimed to prevent was the danger to public because of someone driving a form of transportation on a public highway in a drunken state. So in this case, the, uh, the judges ruled that because the person was riding a bicycle in a drunken state, they said the bicycle is a carriage because it is carrying and by this interpretation, they were able to overcome the mischief. So it gives most discretion, it can help resolve ambiguous situations. But here again, judges can change the law, it interferes with the separation of powers and views and prejudices of the judges can influence the decision. We also looked at intrinsic aids, which are the aids that are inside a statute, things like title, preamble, definitions and so on. We can also make use of extr extrinsic acts, which are outside the statute. That is, what did the parliament say when this case was, when this act, uh, statute was being formed? What were the earlier case laws? What, is, what was the historical setting? What were the dictionaries of the time? And so on, international conventions, regulations and so on. Then uh, in the next lecture, we looked at the law of torts. Tort means a twisted conduct. So it is a breach of duty fixed by law, a duty towards persons. Essentials of tort, there must be a wrongful act committed by a person. 
that results in a legal damage to another now legal damage means a damage to the rights of the person legally not an economic damage so now in this case injuria sand time namno says that injury without damage is actionable so if there is an infringement of a legal right but there is no actual loss in terms of money then do it is actionable but damage without injury is not actionable so there has to be a violation of a right for there to be an action by the court and it must give rise to a legal remedy then we saw that torts are different from breach of contract torts are different from crimes although there are some things that are common between both of them while in crimes mens rea is important but in torts a man is presumed to know the natural and probable consequences of his act then we looked at strict liability if there is a dangerous thing kept on a non natural use of land and it escapes then the person is liable with certain exceptions things that are done with the consent of the plaintiff act of stranger third party act of god and so on now in india the honorable supreme court has come up with this invention of absolute liability so in certain cases the enterprise is absolutely responsible if it is doing a hazardous or inherently dangerous thing it cannot take make use of the exceptions then there are vicarious liabilities that is liability done uh, liability for the wrongs committed by others so in this case the actus reus is also done by other persons examples include principal agent relationship partners and the master servant relationship so there are different kinds of torts affecting person affecting reputation affecting immovable property affecting movable property affecting both person and property so there are different kinds of torts and there are several remedies under these torts as well and lastly we looked at the prevention of cruelty to animals act as an act which we will look in more detail so we saw that the preamble says that the act was made to prevent the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering on animals and for that purpose to amend the law relating to the prevention of cruelty to animals section 1 again is short title extent and commencement it extends to the whole of india from that date as the government will notify in a notification then it defines section 2 defines a large number of things section 4 establishes an animal welfare board of india section 11 defines what is treating an animal cruelly then section 15 makes a committee to control and supervise experiments section 18 is power of entry and inspection section 27 is exemptions under the act section 30 is persons authorized to be public servant so it makes uh, uh, these authorized persons as public servants under the ipc then it gives indemnity to these public servants and then it repeals the earlier law now under any act a large number of rules can be made so rules and regulations can be made now in this case a large number of rules have been made and we looked at the animal birth control dogs rules which is the abc rules now again the rule also starts with the short title in commencement it also has definitions then it says that uh, capturing of dogs shall be done only on specific complaints euthanasia of street dogs that is killing of of street dogs Uh, putting them to sleep can only be done for incurably ill and mortally wounded dogs as are diagnosed by a qualified veterinarian appointed by the committee in the case of furious or dumb rabbit dogs on receipt of complaints the dog will be caught kept in isolation inspected by a panel of two persons kept in isolation till it dies a natural death if it has a high probability of having rabies and otherwise if it is not found to have rabies certain other diseases then it would be handed over to the animal welfare organization who will take necessary action to cure and rehabilitate the dog so if the dog is ferocious but it is not rabid then it must not be killed so this is what we had discussed in modules 4 5 and 6 that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind